an engineer, a psychologist, and an accountant get into a car? Who drives? As an engineer, I would say the engineer should always drive. Advances in the capabilities of artificial intelligence have increased to the point where they are becoming more common in everyday life. Autonomous machines, such as self-driving cars, are no longer a thing of the future. These vehicles are being integrated into society, but there's still a lack of information as to how people will accept this new and innovative technology. I am one of three members of an interdisciplinary team who researches user acceptance of autonomous vehicles. In order to research user acceptance of autonomous vehicles, we created a virtual reality simulation which allows users the experience of riding in a self-driving car as it reacts to different scenarios. And while our research is interesting, and we will share bits of it with you, what we really want to share with you is how our research is only possible because the three of us from drastically different fields and research backgrounds connected. Before my work with autonomous cars, I worked with a NASA research team. They were developing the Ground Collision Avoidance System, Auto GCAS. This system was being developed to help stop controlled flight to terrain, which makes it less likely for a plane to fly into the ground. In doing this research, they asked pilots their opinion of the system. And with an almost unanimous voice, the pilots expressed their disappointment and distrust to any computer-based system being added to their aircraft. They wanted full control. Fast forward several years of development, and after working with the engineers to actually fly with the system activated, they not only began to trust the system, but became comfortable with it as an extra safety feature. So the problem was with the pilots. They were unwilling to work with the system, much like how many people are un unwilling to work with and skeptical of autonomous cars. So how do we design autonomous vehicles in such a way that people want to use them? When I first began researching this subject, I discussed it with other electrical engineers. Getting nowhere fast, I decided to go interdisciplinary. I talked to computer engineers, mechanical engineers, and even chemical engineers. But there was one small problem. All of these people are engineers. Now, don't get me wrong. Engineering teams do amazing work solving problems every day. But this was a problem where more engineers was not the answer. You see, when it comes to what people want in a self-driving car, an engineer can solve the problem of how to make it happen. But I needed someone who could help me figure out what people want in a self-driving car. An engineer, a psychologist, and an accountant get into a car. Who drives? I would propose that the psychologist, whether they're in the driver's seat or not, could make you think that they are doing the driving. I'm Allison. I first met Nathan in the semifinal round of a gladiator-style jousting tournament. It was sponsored by our Graduate Student Association in effort to encourage interdepartmental interaction. Each department on campus put forth a representative who then battled it out with padded jousting sticks on inflated podiums in a head-to-head -head bracket style competition. I represented psychology and Nathan represented electrical engineering. Nathan won our duel and later the tournament. But most importantly, we had both made a connection with a researcher outside of our own field. And after knocking each other off of our respective pedestals, we spent time over the next year discussing our research endeavors and the problems we were facing. So when Nathan began considering what machines need to do in order to be accepted by humans, I was eager to help. My own research focuses on determining how experience and training can impact a worker's ethical performance. I ask questions such as, what do people need to know in order to be ethical in their careers? And now Nathan was trying to ask, what do machines need to know, or rather do, in order to be ethical according to human standards? So when Nathan and I began collaborating, we discovered that when two researchers from such different fields work together, communication is a challenge. At times, I have been convinced that psychology people and engineering people speak two completely different languages. For example, if we discuss trust, Nathan would say from an engineering perspective that it has to do with reliability, meaning you have something you can rely on to do what you want it to do. 
However, in psychology, trust is first defined as a two-way relationship between a trustor and a trustee. And then it is defined as a willingness on both sides to be vulnerable to the other. Combining our differing perspectives leads to questions about what does it mean to rely on or be vulnerable to a seemingly non-human object, one which has no need to trust you in return. Exploring the ideas, theories, and constructs such as these is difficult when you don't even think or talk about them in the same way. Collaborating can lead to more questions than answers at first. And communication is essential for the advancement of interdisciplinary research and the achievement of its related benefits. So working together, Nathan and I learned that our first goal of interdisciplinary communication was to just agree on shared research questions. Some of our research questions became, why would somebody want to use a self-driving car? What do people care about when it comes to trusting a machine? And how important is it for somebody to understand the technology, for them to trust its design? After agreeing on research questions, our second goal of interdisciplinary communication was to create a common language. We needed a framework of shared understanding on which we could base our research endeavors, one which would encompass relevant knowledge from both our fields. This is again where interdisciplinary work is challenging. Each representative must know their own field well enough to discern the important information and then translate it in a way that can be understood by the other. In order to create a comprehensive framework, we first had to collect and assemble information from both of our fields. Psychological theories of reasoned action and behavior helped us to understand that humans behave in ways that align with their attitudes towards an object, their expectations of societal norms, and their belief in their ability to control their own behavior and outcomes. Previous technology acceptance studies showed acceptance rate of old new technology, such as cell phones and email, and their usefulness in the workplace. So piecing together such prominent theories and research findings from our respective fields, we were able to create a framework of human acceptance of autonomous vehicles. We call this the Safety Critical Technology Acceptance Model, or CTAM. The model incorporates theory of reasoned action items around how attitudes towards the cars themselves, the decision-making strategies, and any governing authority or regulations can lead to whether or not somebody will choose to ride in a self-driving car. Furthermore, the model incorporates items such as perceived ease of use and overall usefulness of technology with transportation-specific concerns such as safety expectancy and critical response capability. So with this model, we had brought forth our respective fields. We had learned to communicate in a shared language, and we were able to create a unique framework which we could begin to use to understand what people really do care about when it comes to these self-driving cars. However, despite communication and creation of an overall framework, we again found ourselves stalled out and not getting any further with our research. We needed to move our model from theoretical into action and assessment, but the question was how? We needed direction. An engineer, a psychologist, and an accountant get into a car. Who drives? The accountant, because you can always count on them. I'm Sarah. Last year, I took a psychology course and through this met Allison. I learned about the research that she and Nathan were working on and it was fascinating engineering and psychology working together to study autonomous vehicles, I wanted in. I could see that they were struggling with action. When you bring minds together and get them thinking and communicating, it can be really easy for things to stay in theoretical discussion for too long. This was happening with Nathan and Allison, and this is where I fit in. They needed structure. Structure is crucial to interdisciplinary research. Without it, things can get stuck. And the structure that they needed was having another person on their team with a background in planning and organization, a business person. From my business perspective, planning is key to any project. It is just as important in conducting an interdisciplinary research study. It is essential for people from such different domains to make a shared plan and be organized in moving towards a defined goal. Because I was joining the team after some of the theoretical discussion, I was in an excellent position to drive the project into action. 
my own inexperience with scientific research meant that I needed to ask questions that my teammates could answer based on knowledge and experience from their respective fields. Questions that were important from my accounting perspective, though. So the first one, why do we care? If you think this is a question any team would ask, let me clarify. Accountants care about the bottom line, money, or really value. What was the value of this research to the general public? When it comes to autonomous cars, it matters because you aren't making your own decisions anymore. A machine is, and the people designing those machines should know what matters most to you. My next question, what are we going to do about it? We wanted to give people an opportunity to share their thoughts and concerns. And let me tell you, anytime you say you study self-driving cars, people want to tell you what they think about them. We had to do this in a measurable way, though. We had to measure how much people cared about aspects of the CTAM with their inclination towards buying or using one of these cars. So how do we capture attitudes that humans have? Psychological research had an answer. Self-report surveys are often used as a method of attitude assessment. So our team spent hours formatting questions that could get to the core of trust and authority for surveys intended to capture the elements of the CTAM. Okay, so can those attitudes be changed? Perhaps, but how? Could an experience with technology work? Maybe, but how could we give people a safe and meaningful experience? Engineering has an answer. Virtual reality simulation could give the experience of riding in a self-driving car. So we design various different scenarios to provide variation and meaning. Bringing these elements together, we had our pilot study. Virtual reality for an experience riding in a self-driving car, surveys to capture any change in attitude measurement, and an understanding of how our study could be a valuable contribution to the design of autonomous vehicles. Being organized was necessary, and having structure to make one uniform pilot study was important. So, an engineer, a psychologist, and an accountant get into a car. Who drives? In our case, the car. But we all had a part in making that decision. I started with a problem. I had the ability to design autonomous vehicles, but I didn't know what I should be designing them to do. So Nathan and I worked together to communicate across both our fields. We established research questions and a framework for understanding what people care about when it comes to self-driving cars and what aspects are needed for them to trust and use them. Then I came on board and encouraged structure, which enabled us to overcome the obstacles to putting research into action. As a result, we conducted a, vir a, conducted a pilot study and developed a virtual reality simulator. This explored how having a simulated experience of riding in a self-driving car can impact human perspectives and acceptance of autonomous vehicles. What we found is that there are a number of factors which impact user acceptance of self-driving cars, such as trust, an individual's willingness to be vulnerable, their need to understand the technology, their belief in a car's benevolence, and the value they have for the benefits they perceive from these self-driving cars. At this point, our research is far from done. We still need to discover more about what people want in new technology, and how an experience can affect technology's design. But what we have learned in our work as this interdisciplinary team is that research on autonomous vehicles can be done, but it cannot be done autonomously. 